thank you, Robbie. It's, it's great to see you again, and it's, it's great to be here uh, at ICT. Thank you to um, Stevie Weinberg and ICT for inviting me to speak today on this important question. You might be wondering from my bio um, how I'm going to, 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 to address it. Um, I'm actually going to, to speak largely about a study that um, we did at the Washington Institute that we, uh, over a period of about 18 months, um, we uh, dove deep into issues of countering violent extremism, um, current practices and recommendations. This was a study that we did, although we're a nonpartisan organization, whenever there's a transition in the U.S. government, um, we write re recommendations for the, for the incoming administration, whether it be Democratic or Republican. So this is a study that we came out with um, a couple of years ago. Um, so I'm going to focus my remarks first, however, uh, on the implications of this debate over the relative importance, what's kind of set up in the title of this panel, Immigration, Integration, and CT Challenges, the relative importance um, of the threat from international versus domestic terrorism, um, as well as the role of immigration with respect to those threats, uh, and then I'll also talk about the need to adapt, adopt, and properly resource the appropriate tools, um, in particular programs that fall into the category of terrorism prevention or counter-violent extremism, um, in order to counter this threat. So in preparing my remarks for today, I recalled a debate that took place in the latter part of the last decade. Um, some of you may recall this. There was a book uh, that came out, Leaderless Jihad, by Mark Sageman um, and Bruce Hoffman, both, you know, preeminent terrorist scholars, wrote a review of it, um, and then they clashed really over the future of terrorism, that is, whether or not the primary threat um, was from, uh, primary threat to the West came from a reconstitution of Al-Qaeda in, in safe havens, an expansion of its networks abroad, um, or if it came from radicalized individuals and groups acting independently within Europe and the US. Um, and I thought about this because I think this is a, a debate, um, you know, albeit a, a, what was largely an academic debate that played out on the pages of journals, one that is also relevant to practitioners and to policymakers, and one that we need to continue to focus on um, and perhaps wasn't adequately addressed prim uh, or previously. So it has implications for how we conceptualize of the threat and allocate resources to mitigate it. And I found this quote from uh, John Piccarelli, who is with the National Institutes of Justice, um, where I felt like he, he kind of got that point, the idea that if the greater threat or the threat that's prioritized as a foreign threat, there's greater focus on foreign intelligence in particular, perhaps kinetic responses, um, Intelligence in particular in terms of IDing the threats abroad before they reach the homeland, um, if, we, if we look at the greater threat or we want to prioritize and resource appropriately, um, the threat that comes from within, the threat of individuals who are uh, radicalized or acting uh, mostly independently, um, then we need to stress community outreach. So of course we need to do both of these things. And the reality is, is they're more greatly intertwined today um, than they were when this debate took place 10 years ago. Uh, because in the digital age, of course, we are very networked. Um, we know that, for example, what we do overseas in terms of uh, countering terrorist threats have implications for radicalization. I think a good example of this is if you look at the, uh, the post-territorial uh, uh, caliphate and the impact that has on Islamic State propaganda and its ability to recruit and radicalize, um, we've seen that threat decline. Um, but the most immediate threat facing us today does indeed come from inspired actors in small groups or working individually. Um, so I'm, I'm reluctant to, to say alone, but I am talking about homegrown violent extremists. They are harder to detect, they leave fewer clues, um, in the age of social media, they may not have traveled to terrorist hotspots um, or to, uh, for, for training and indoctrinization, an earlier flag of radicalization for law enforcement. Rather, they are inspired by online propaganda and often even in direct contact, despite having not traveled, with um, recruiters or outreach operators from foreign terrorist organizations. 
They often self-fund through legitimate or illicit means. A good example of this was um, the, the personal loan that the attacker in San Bernardino took out just before his attack. And they need different responses. Um, we need to look at different tools, and that's why I'm going to talk about prevention um, and countering violent extremism programs. Um, but to be clear, I see these not as a substitute for more traditional counterterrorism tools, um, but a supplement. So what is the role of immigration, both as a threat within this context and the utility of immigration policy as a response? So within the U.S., there's been a lot of focus on this, the role of border security in preventing terrorism, um, both kind of rhetorically and in the most recent national counterterrorism strategy that came out in 2018. Um, but what we see here is this is actually a study that was done by the Department of Homeland Security in 2017 and was, was leaked um, uh, sometime after that, uh, that assesses that the majority of foreign-born U.S.-based violent extremists were actually radicalized after entering the U.S. Um, so there have been a number of other efforts to frame the, the, the issue differently. Um, there was a study, actually a report that came out following when, when President Trump uh, first put in place his travel ban, which was a ban on the entry of uh, individuals from six majority Muslim countries into the U.S. Um, that actual executive order required reporting by the Departments of Justice and Departments of Homeland Security um, on how those countries were determined and the effectiveness of this approach. And a report came out that has since been discredited. Um, but what it claimed, the way it was able to support uh, the claim that, um, sorry, let me just find this quote. Uh, support the claim that the vast majority of individuals convicted of terrorism and terrorism-related offenses since 9-11 came from outside the U.S. in one way was that it included individuals who'd actually been extradited um, from overseas into the U.S. to stand trial. So clearly these, these individuals were not radicalized after they entered the U.S., but they also were not present in the U.S. necessarily um, before or when they committed attacks. Uh, another interesting, another thing that such, an, such a frame um, misses is the idea that that study only looked, uh, the discredited study only looked at international terrorism. Um, and this is an issue I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a minute, but um, the idea that uh, it excluded any sort of domestic terrorism. So that basically means um, within the U.S. system, that they weren't tied, only those who had been tied to what was a designated foreign terrorist organization um, are considered to be uh, uh, active in international terrorism. So those are the only ones that were counted in this study. Um, in fact, if you look at this DHS study from 2017, what it says is that the majority of those uh, US or those foreign born ex violent extremists who were present in the US um, had been there for more than 10 years before they were indicted, or in fact, many of them were killed, um, which would seem to indicate that existing intelligence-supported vetting procedures had been sufficient, um, because many of them, in fact, came as children. Uh, the study reports that there were no signs uh, amongst their parents or those uh, guardians who came with them of extremism. So the 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 procedures in place um, that are supported by intelligence uh, and, and vetting are adequate uh, to, to try uh, to, to identify um, individuals who've been radicalized before coming to the U.S. And that immigration policy is perhaps not the proper tool um, or, or not a good tool at all to try to um, uh, keep radical extremists um, and violent extremists from entering the United States. What, sorry, I need to go back for a second, I'm gonna go back. Um, what the leaked report also shows is that it went beyond quantifying the risk from foreign-born uh, extremists, tying radicalization to problems with integration. Um, and the quote, it says, integration and mentoring services offer an opportunity to help foreign-born U.S. residents adjust their new, to their new communities and raise their awareness of and resistance to violent extremist narratives and recruiters and likely increase their resistance to radicalization. 
So it identifies a role for um, interventions uh, after, um, after, uh, after migrants um, have, have come to the US to help with integration and that may be a way to keep them off of the path to radicalization. As well, it emphasizes the importance of programs that aim to prevent or counter violent extremism through a focus exactly on integration and mentorship. Quote, the experience and grievances we assessed as common within these individuals, meaning those who are foreign-born um, violent extremists, um, present opportunities for CVE, or countering, countering violent extremism programs, focused on integration and mentorship. So I wanted to, before I go into the study that I mentioned before that I completed with my colleagues at the Washington Institute, I wanted to talk about just a couple of the kind of specific U.S. challenges when it comes to uh, looking at domestic terrorism and countering violent extremism. And I don't think these are unique to the U.S., but some of them um, uh, are, 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 are more common probably in the U.S. than, than other places in the world and, and definitely worth um, uh, considering. So when looking at intervening, um, left of boom, so to speak, as law enforcement like to call it, meaning in that period, that pre-criminal, um, that period where radicalization takes place, identifying someone. Um, you can also use kind of the, the, the often cited uh, uh, detect, disrupt, dismantle kind of approach. When working in that area, one of the key problems in the U.S. is this is a pre-criminal space. So, um, individuals, uh, there's, there's a, actually four cases at least of individuals who engaged in attacks, who completed attacks in the U.S., who had been identified um, either by law enforcement, other people in the community prior to uh, undertaking a terrorist attack, but because at that point, because of their suspicious behavior, because they espoused radical or extremist ideas, but because at that point no law had been broken, uh, law enforcement wasn't able to do anything. And here there's a picture of Omar Mateen, who of course was the attacker in the um, Orlando shooting in, in 2016. He had been interviewed by the FBI after coworkers had expressed concerns about his, um, uh, about him, and the FBI wasn't able to take any sort of um, uh, action and, and dismissed him. Um, relatedly, uh, this is because in the U.S. it's not criminal to hold certain beliefs or associate with others who do. Relatedly, there's no domestic terrorist organization designation or domestic terrorist statute within the United States. Um, and this is what I said earlier when you talk about uh, international terrorism, this is uh, this is, this is uh, restricted to individuals who are associated with uh, terrorist organizations that have been designated as such. Um, and if an individual is with a domestic organization, even though there's a domestic, there's a definition in US law of domestic uh, terrorism, um, that is not, uh, there is, there's not a, a, a statute associated with it that allows a criminal charge. There's no separate terrorism charge for ideologically motivated violence in the U.S. unless it is tied to a designated foreign terrorist organization. Um, the proliferation in the U.S. of anti-government, white supremacists, groups on the both far right and far left, um, these are not considered terrorist organization. This limits the ability of law enforcement to intervene early, such as on the basis of material support charge, or in the case, um, as they can in the case of foreign or international terrorism. Um, and this is one of the key charges that's been used in the context of uh, foreign fighters um, in the U.S. or those individuals who wanted to travel to join the Islamic State, um, and, and they could be charged as giving material support, which was themselves, or conspiracy to provide material support. Um, sensitivities, of course, arrive from the implications of adopting a domestic terrorism statute in the U.S. because of the implications on free speech. Um, but there is, in fact, pending legislation that proposes establishing new charges um, importantly, without designating domestic terrorist organizations, because that's where um, a lot of the, the sensitivity arises from. What it would do is it would, it would add a terrorism offense and describe it um, and criminalize knowingly contributing to the preparation or a conspiracy to commit something that meets that definition. Um, so this would be narrowly constructed to avoid criminalizing speech and association, yet prevent, um, give law enforcement additional tools to prevent uh, uh, violent extremism. So um, 
there are things that we think, the authors, uh, my co-authors and I of this study, um, that, that can be done. Um, so this was a study that came out in 2017. Some of my co-authors are here at the conference, uh, Matt Levitt and, and Aaron Zellin. Um, we also uh, worked with former officials from both Democratic and Republican administrations in order to make it a truly bipartisan, bipartisan product. Uh, what we looked at is um, preventing and countering violent extremism um, as a priority policy issue, and this had emerged in the U.S. really following the Boston Marathon bombing, um, when the Obama administration had taken it up and presented its first strategy. Um, because this idea uh, that the flash to bang, the, the process of radicalization really was much quicker in the digital age, and that there was a need to be able to get into that space to, to off-ramp people who were clearly on a path um, uh, of radicalization uh, and, and subsequently to, vi to violence. So um, our report uh, largely focused on this new threat environment, the, uh, the, the priority, uh, the primary threat of, um, of uh, radically or domestically radicalized individuals um, or, or lone or independent actors, uh, homegrown violent extremism, um, then we looked at the, the kind of past efforts that had taken place towards the end of the Obama administration, and uh, we concluded with uh, a, a series of recommendations. I'm not going to go through them all here. There's about, uh, I think, at least 25 to 30 of them that go through strategic recommendations and structural recommendations um, that I would encourage you uh, to look to read the study um, uh, to, to find out more about what all of those are. Um, but basically, uh, what we did is we proposed that the government should support local public-private partnerships uh, focused on doing two key things. One is building resilience within communities to promote public safety and prevent violent extremist ideologies from taking hold. And the second one, promoting and facilitating community-led intervention programs focused on countering radicalization and recruitment. Um, so the latter is in the more traditional purview of, counter, of, of CVE programming. Um, in our formulation, we looked at what is now, I think, a much used, uh, a popular kind of um, uh, framework, which is considering it a public health approach. So the idea that the first um, thing you need to do is in a community uh, where you might see a, a, a problem with violent extremism or a radical ideology is to try to, and even those where you don't, is to build resilience, to inoculate those communities from a health perspective. You would think of it that way. Um, it's preclinical space um, that's focused on prevention. And we're careful to, to recommend that, um, that there is an accounting of where what kinds of programmatic activity fall in this range of uh, things that are more CVE uh, specific versus those that are CVE relevant. So really in the prevention space, uh, things that I think tend to, um, uh, tend to encourage uh, uh, critics of CVE efforts to say, this is everything and so it's nothing. You know, midnight basketball and stuff like that. Things that are, that are CVE relevant, but not CVE specific. The next level is um, where you deal with the exposure. So in a community where there has been identified um, a, a problem with radical ideology, um, you, you try to take a community approach. If not, you um, try to uh, segregate the individual. Think of this again from a health uh, perspective. If you were going to quarantine someone um, when they so show signs of infection, and this is where uh, this study looks into how to develop programs that can be community-based, where there can be interventions in that pre-criminal space to try to off-ramp an individual um, on the path of radicalization to violence. Um, and and really, that actually goes into the third, which is where you're you're treating. Um, the, 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 after you've seen the sign of infections, then you're treating the illness. So this is uh, it's just following through on the inter those intervention programs and even looking at rehabilitation um, and de-radicalization um, on the other side. So um, just one more quick thing to mention, since I know I'm running out of time, is, is the importance that we put in our approach on um, looking at the full range of... Uh, of, of, of um, of radical uh, and, and extreme ideologies. So the idea that if you're going to tr truly take a public health approach and put public safety first, that you can't focus exclusively um, on, uh, you know, radical I Islamist extremism, um, 
because for a couple of reasons. One is that 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 is uh, that is that's part of the criticism of early CVE efforts. They were they were largely securitized. They they were seen to be too focused on Muslim communities. But also that many of the tools um, that are developed within this this area can be applied across uh, extremist ideologies. So in the U.S., we have seen this proliferation of right and left extremists, whether it's anti-government or white supremacists um, or otherwise. And this is, uh, we think it's important to focus development of these programs to address that full range. Um, because, and I'll just say finally, because it does matter kind of the terminology that you use when talking about them. And so this has been part of the big debate around CVE. It's a very toxic term, and this is something I even saw in my own community. When at, a, at the neighborhood that I live in, we were trying to do um, an event to look at um, some of the uh, policies of the new administration, public awareness sort of thing, and the unwillingness to bring in law enforcement to this because it was, uh, had, had, you know, law enforcement was not seen as a trusted partner when it came to issues of, um, of, of extremism uh, because of the history of CVE. But on the other hand, on the other side of it, you've also had a lot of concerns throughout the, the Trump administration about even more toxic terms, radical Islamic extremism, um, terrorism prevention, which would limit it to just being, uh, you know, things that are clearly defined as terrorism and not the broader radical uh, uh, ideological spectrum. Um, but ultimately, it, it, it seems now that the framework is being rebuilt under, uh, under the title of, of, of prevention overall, and um, I think I see that as a positive thing. And I'm getting the eye from, from Robbie now that I'm out of time. So uh, thank you very much for your intention, attention, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you.